Okay, well, we might just get started while we do some, some housekeeping, waiting for JP to come along. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to um, this OPUS seminar. My name is Samantha Bunsley, and on behalf of the OPUS Education and Training Committee, um, I welcome you along today. Um, I'd like to begin today by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm zooming in from today, um, the Jagara country, and the lands on which you are zooming in from today, uh, acknowledging that sovereignty uh, across Australia has never been ceded. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of these lands and extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Strait Islander people who are in the audience today. Now the topic for today's OPUS webinar is communicating with people seeking care for musculoskeletal pain, uh, presented by myself and JP Caniero. Um, today I'll be presenting first for the first 20 minutes, followed by Dr. Caniero, and then we'll have a 20 minute Q&A session at the end. Now your videos and microphones have been turned off. Uh, to post your questions at any time, please use the Q&A box. Um, however, we will be leaving any questions to, to the end of the session. Um, and when we get to our Q&A um, time slot, if you would prefer to, to ask your question aloud, then please just raise your hand and we'll be able to uh, unmute you. I will try to wrap up our Q&A relatively promptly, so on the hour. Um, but if you have any other questions, uh, please don't hesitate to contact JP or myself via email following the session. Okay, so without further ado, we might get started with my first presentation. So for those of you who don't know me, I am a physiotherapist and a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Melbourne uh, Department of Surgery. And I um, am a postdoc within the Centre for Research Excellence in Total Joint Replacement, known as OPUS. And I also chair the OPUS Education and Training Committee. So in my research, I use qualitative methods to understand the beliefs, behaviours and experiences of care among people with musculoskeletal pain and their clinicians. And today I'd like to share with you five tips to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain. Now, this is Sarah's story. My knees started hurting about 10 years ago. I had a scan a couple of years back and it showed wear and tear of the cartilage lining the knee joints. My mum's knees are really bad and she can barely work, walk now. I'm worried that I'll end up that way too, so I'm really careful to protect my knees. I avoid stairs and walking too far. I've cut back to work part-time. It's taken a toll on our finances and my general health. I've stacked on the weight since I've stopped exercising. Now we need to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain. In this talk, I'll explain <coughs> excuse me, why we need to change what we need to change and how we can change. So why do we need to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain? Well, in 2017, between a quarter to one third of Australians, or approximately 7 million of us, reported arthritis and other musculoskeletal conditions. This means that most Australians will have either experienced musculoskeletal pain themselves or know someone close to them who has. Now, the costs of musculoskeletal pain are enormous. Um, pain conditions are the leading cause of mobility limitation and early retirement in adults aged 24 to 65. And while clinical guidelines recommend non-surgical interventions such as physiotherapy and lifestyle change, including exercise and weight loss as the first line interventions for musculoskeletal pain, these are typically underused in Australia. While the rate of invasive surgical interventions such as joint replacement surgery is placing untenable strain on our health resources. And as we're getting older, heavier and moving less, over the next decade, the prevalence of musculoskeletal pain conditions is projected to increase by 41%. So what can we do as clinicians to help stem this rising burden of disease? Well, one thing we can do is to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain, because the way we talk about our health shapes what we think and what we do about it. And currently the dominant way of talking emphasizes impairment and social and economic disengagement, which contributes to the burden of musculoskeletal pain. So what is the dominant way of talking? Now in our qualitative research, exploring the way people with musculoskeletal pain talk, we have identified a dominant impairment discourse. 
So according to this discourse, bodies are like machines and pain indicates a broken part or signals a broken part of the body machinery. Now the body like any machine comes with a manufacturer's use by date according to this discourse, after which time it's not considered safe to use. And while lifetime use varies from person to person, there's a sense of inevitability that one day this use by date will be reached. Now, let me illustrate this discourse in the context of knee osteoarthritis. So we found that people who use an impairment discourse describe healthy knees as well-oiled machine parts that glide smoothly over each other. And they describe knee osteoarthritis as worn out cartilage that causes the joint surfaces to grind and catch during movement. They commonly speak about bone rubbing on bone. Uh, people often use car analogies to explain their situation such as um, my knee is like an unoiled engine that's seized up or the cartilage is worn out just like brake pads in the car. And just like driving with worn out brake pads, according to this discourse, using worn out joints is considered to be irresponsible and unsafe. Now also like an inert car part, bones can't regenerate. And there's little that people can do themselves about their damaged joint surfaces, other than to avoid activity so as not to make the damage worse. The only real solution um, is to seek out a mechanic to fix the broken machine, to repair the bones and then resolve the pain. So I believe in nuts and bolts. If something's worn out, you pull it out and you put a new part in. Now this impairment discourse is problematic because it gives rise to what we've identified as five key misconceptions or myths about musculoskeletal pain. And these are one, that pain is always a sign of damage. Myth two, that musculoskeletal pain only gets worse over time. Myth three, that weight bearing damages your joints. Myth four, that physio can't replace cartilage, so there's no point in doing it. And myth five, that I need surgery to cure my pain. In our interview studies with people experiencing a range of musculoskeletal conditions from back pain to sacroiliac pain, knee pain and hip pain, have shown that these myths are common across different musculoskeletal pain populations. So we see them across um, these different conditions. And we've also seen that they're endorsed by people of different cultures and different ages. So in our recent systematic review of 56 studies involving people with knee osteoarthritis, um, their carers and clinicians, we observed that these myths were occurring and this impairment discourse really dominated in studies from 16 different Western and non-Western countries. And we also see these myths um, among health professionals. And while clinicians may not explicitly endorse these myths, it's possible that they may be implicitly endorsing them. So JP Caniero, who you're going to hear from next, um, led a study where physios were tasked with an implicit association task. Um, and he showed that in contrast to what the physios self-reported, um, the physios were faster to associate images of bending and lifting with a round back um, with words representing danger than um, with words representing safety. So this meant that the physios in the study reported or displayed an implicit bias towards round back bending and lifting as being dangerous for the back. And JP is going to tell you more about that in the following presentation. Now we call these myths or misconceptions because they do not align with what we know from the scientific evidence. So science tells us that pain is not always a sign of damage, but is the experience that arises from a complex inter uh, uh, combination of social, psychological and biomedical factors. Science also tells us that not all musculoskeletal pain will get worse over time and with aging, but instead there are multiple trajectories of musculoskeletal pain, including trajectories of stability and trajectories of recovery. And science tells us that not all loading exercise is harmful for articular cartilage, oh, sorry, that the loading exercise itself, sorry, is not harmful for articular cartilage and that all people with musculoskeletal pain benefit from being physically active. Science tells us that physiotherapy programs can result in significant improvements in pain that are sustained over a long period of time. 
And finally, science tells us that surgery to fix damage does not always result in a resolution of pain, but that many people, and indeed almost most people, continue to experience some level of pain up to 12 months post-surgery. Now, why are these myths a problem? Well, because our beliefs influence what we do and how we cope with musculoskeletal pain. Now, currently, many people are making decisions based on myths about musculoskeletal pain and finding themselves trapped in a vicious cycle of pain, disability, and distress. Now, to better understand this vicious cycle, the common sense model can be a useful framework. Um, and I'll explain that to you um, here, giving you an example of somebody who has experienced a symptom of low back pain when lifting. So let's say that on experiencing the symptom, the person, um, well, when we experience any symptom, uh, uh, we, we immediately draw on a set of beliefs about what we think the symptom is. So we can think about, or we typically think about what caused the symptom, what the consequences of the symptom will be, how much control we're gonna have over the symptom and how long the symptom will last. And these beliefs are informed by our previous experiences of the symptom, by observing others and the wider public discourse on musculoskeletal pain, including what we might've heard from the media or from health professionals. So let's say in this case, this particular person believes that the symptom is caused by a disc bulge. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They've heard that a disc bulge can compress the spinal cord and leave them in a wheelchair. And that's a really distressing thought. Let's imagine this person is a parent of a dependent young child. So the threat of being immobile is really distressing to them. Now, a common sense response to this threatening representation might be to avoid physical activity and movement that they think is going to make the, the, the pain or the damage, the disc bulge worse, and to seek out care to understand the extent of the damage and to fix it. So that could be a common sense response to this, these threatening beliefs around their pain. The problem is, though, that these behavioural responses can themselves perpetuate pain and disability. So, for example, Bracing and guarding a joint can itself be pro-nociceptive by increasing tissue loading. Uh, avoidance of physical activity has a negative impact on a person's musculoskeletal as well as their general health. Uh, avoidance of social and work activities can impact on um, identity and job security, which impacts on emotional, um, further compounds emotional distress. And all of this can serve to heighten the pain experience. Um, we also know that inappropriate imaging can cause harm through the misinterpretation of results, um, leading to unnecessary downstream investigations and invasive interventions, including surgery. Now, evidence suggests that these um, unhelpful pain beliefs play a key role in the transition from acute to chronic musculoskeletal pain. Uh, prospective studies involving individuals without musculoskeletal pain at baseline have found that unhelpful beliefs predict the incidence of future disabling pain. Well, among people with acute pain at baseline, unhelpful beliefs predict the severity of disability over time. So it's really important that we dispel these myths and talk about musculoskeletal pain in a way that aligns with the scientific evidence and gives rise to helpful beliefs and helpful behaviors. So how can we do this? Well, in the following slides, I'm gonna propose five tips to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain. The first thing we can do as a clinician to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain is to reflect on our own beliefs and biases. So as I mentioned earlier, um, under a time constraint context, clinicians can display associations and memory that are not always entirely reflective of their self-reported beliefs. And it may be in the context of a busy clinic, these implicit biases can influence the, langu the language clinicians use <clears throat> and the, uh, the choices that clinicians are making. So taking the time to reflect on our own beliefs and biases as clinicians can be really helpful. So you might ask yourself questions such as, what are my own experiences with pain? What beliefs do I hold about the body in pain? How does this influence the way I communicate about pain? And am I aware of my own clinical biases? And with consent from a patient, you might want to film the consultation and watch it back to yourself or ask a, a peer for feedback. The second thing you can do as a clinician to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain is to carefully assess how the person seeking care is making sense of their own symptoms. So using the common sense model as a framework, you can ask, 
um, questions to explore beliefs around the identity, the causes, the consequences, the controllability and uh, recovery expectations. So asking questions such as, what's your understanding of your symptoms? How do your symptoms impact you? What do you think is the cause of your symptoms? How much control do you have over your symptoms? When you experience your symptoms, what do you do? And what do you imagine the future looks like? And in their responses, you want to be listening for any myths that need to be addressed or any gaps in understanding that need to be filled. Now, my third tip as you address these myths and fill in these gaps is to avoid using jargon. Now, people presenting for care commonly use jargon during the consultation that they've picked up from previous care encounters, um, from talking to, to others or from Dr. Google. Um, but just because they're using these words doesn't necessarily mean that they're interpreting them correctly. And I usually try to slip the slide in somewhere in my talks because I think it's a really powerful illustration of how communication can go wrong. So 12 years ago now, um, Barker and colleagues conducted this focus group with, um, with lay people who were not experiencing pain. And they asked these individuals how they interpreted common words used in the context of low back pain. And here are some of the, the key problematic words or terms that they identified. So degeneration, it's shrinkage, it's unnatural, something's rushing away. I'll end up in a wheelchair. Wear and tear, the bones are getting thinner. Bone on bone, I need to stop weight bearing. And neurological, well, they think I'm a hypochondriac or it could be a tumor. So powerful words there. Now of concern, we have documented similar misinterpretations of these problematic terms in our qualitative interviews with people experiencing chronic musculoskeletal pain. So these are people who have widely sought care for their pain and are still having difficulties interpreting and correctly interpreting these words. So checking how people seeking care understand the meaning of these words and the words that they're using is really important. Um, and here teach back can be a useful strategy whereby at the end of the consultation, people can be asked to explain what took place in the consultation in their own words. Now, the fourth thing you can do as a clinician to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain is to steer away from using an impairment discourse um, to avoid referencing the body as a machine and to adopt a more participatory discourse. And what is a participatory discourse? Now, the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, known as the ICF, defined participation as involvement in a life situation. And they consider this to be the ultimate health outcome. A participatory discourse focuses on what people can do to enable them to participate in valued life activities, despite any pathoanatomical changes to their body structures. And we've found evidence that a participatory discourse also exists in the musculoskeletal pain community. So we found that people who use a participatory discourse describe healthy joints as those which enable the body to remain busy or active throughout their, journey, their life journey. So as according to this, joints can show signs of osteoarthritis, for example, but still be perceived to be healthy if they enable the body to be active. So people who use this discourse shift the focus away from addressing pathoanatomical changes to focus instead on what they can do to maintain their health and life participation. Our research has also shown that people who use this discourse tend to see their joints as more than just cartilage and bones, but rather as structures which are cocooned in muscles. And unlike cartilage and bones, muscles can regenerate. So they are visible to the eye and they're also under voluntary control. So by building up muscles, joints are perceived to become stronger or more able and thus more healthy. So a quote here, it's the same on the inside, but now it's a stronger knee. I have stronger muscles around the knee and I can do what I want to do. So by focusing on strength and participation, this discourse really places the person experiencing pain in the driver's seat and they're steering their own way to their own health. And another quote here, I think you can control the pace of knee osteoarthritis. You can control your lifestyle, your eating habits. It's not just about my knee, it's about my general health and well-being. 
So the role of the clinician in this discourse shifts from being the fixer or the curer towards empowering people who are experiencing pain to take control of their own health journey. And it's just for the clinician, it's a matter of ensuring that each individual is really equipped with the resources and has the capacity to navigate that own journey. Now, of course, some people with musculoskeletal pain do end up undergoing surgical interventions. But even when surgery is indicated, using a participatory discourse can complement management and provide guidance for recovery and rehabilitation by focusing on what people can do rather than what they can't do. Now, the fifth thing you can do as a clinician to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain is to take care with written as well as spoken language. Now, it's common to observe written comments along the lines of the patient failed conservative treatment and now requires surgery. And there was a great editorial in uh, the journal Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research a few years back on this very topic, which argued that the idea of failing non-operative treatment implies that surgical treatment is needed for success. Um, it also implies that conservative non-operative treatment is a stage to pass through and that all roads are eventually going to lead to surgery. It also suggests though that the person seeking care is a, is a failure in some way, that this person who is already suffering and, and has failed despite having done nothing wrong. So more useful language um, could be, we offered the individual surgery because they were not satisfied following a reasonable period of non-operative care. And this sort of better implies that surgery is only one option of many and that the individual has ownership over that final decision. Now to demonstrate how you can apply these steps in practice, uh, my collaborators at Kevin University led by JP, who you're going to hear from next, have developed a series of online videos. Now these videos model helpful and unhelpful language of people seeking care for musculoskeletal pain. And they're designed to be interactive in the format of a quiz um, with links to further reading. Now a link to the low back pain quiz can be seen on the screen here. And I encourage you all to go and have a look at that if you haven't already. But keep your eye out for a knee quiz and I think a hip one in the near future too. JP will be able to tell us more. Uh, but I have a sh short preview for you here. So hopefully this works okay. Um, here we go. Thanks for seeing me, JP. I'm worried about the exercise that I'm doing is going to create more arthritic damage to my knee. Right, Chris, that's a very common belief. Uh, in society, but it's very important for you to understand that exercise is safe um, and it's actually helpful for the knee joint. In fact, people that exercise can get pain relief from exercising. The important aspect of that is that you do it in a gradual manner uh, and regularly. So there's a minimum dose of exercise that you need to do for your knee joint to achieve those benefits. And what happens is that with this regularity, of weight-bearing exercises, you build the capacity of your knee to tolerate load. You, with movement, you nourish the knee joint and the knee joint becomes healthier and stronger. <laughs> Thanks for seeing me, JP. I'm right. So that's the end of my talk. Now, in summary, our five take home tips to change the way we talk about musculoskeletal pain are number one to self-reflect on our own biases um, as clinicians and beliefs step two to assess the perceptions of our patients seeking care step three to avoid the use of jargon step four to try to move away from an impairment discourse and adopt a participatory discourse and tip five to take care with written language and I would just like to acknowledge all my wonderful Opus collaborators on the work I've presented today, um, particularly at Latrobe, Prof Nick Taylor and Prof Nora Shields, as well as the Curtin Group, um, Peter Sullivan and Smith and JP, and also here at the University of Melbourne, um, Michelle Dowsey, Peter Chung and Penny O'Brien. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And I believe we have JP with us. Hi, JP. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Now, JP, I am going to um, introduce you today for those of you who, who don't know JP. Um, Dr. JP Kenyero is a specialist physiotherapist and has a PhD in musculoskeletal physiotherapy. 
JP has worked for over 17 years as a clinician, researcher, and lecturer on the field of, in the field of musculoskeletal pain management. Uh, he's published over 40 research papers and presented his work in key conferences across the globe. He's an emerging leader in the field of chronic pain, particularly in the management of back pain and osteoarthritis. Uh, at Curtin, JP has a postdoctoral uh, research position linked to the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence, uh, OPUS, and he also lectures in the Masters of Clinical Physiotherapy. Uh, JP also consults three days a week at BodyLogic, where he reviews complex musculoskeletal pain disorders, in a particular, um, the lower back and knee pain. So it's my pleasure to hand over now to JP. Thank you, JP. Thank you so much, Sam. And JP also runs late every now and then. <laughs> so I'm really sorry, everyone, for jumping a little, a little bit late. So let me just share my screen. Uh, let's stop sharing. Just tell me if you can. Oops. Can you see my slides? That was good, JP. Cool. So the the idea of the presentation today is to um, is to talk through an example of using communication uh, throughout the the process of uh, interview examination and management of patients. Uh, so we often think of communication as being around how we should interview a patient, uh, but it's becoming more and more clear that if we want to implement behavioral change, the way we communicate with patients need to come across very consistently uh, in the way we converse with them during the interview, but also in the way we examine patients uh, in terms of our body language and, um, and the, you know, the ver verbal cues that we, that we use, uh, but also in the way that we come up to, to planning uh, a management with patients. Um, so Sam spoke, uh, you know, her talk was around Neo Way, and I'm going to present to you some of the results that I have from my, um, from my PhD, uh, which was uh, around back pain, and use that as an example uh, but the talk that I'm doing here today, it goes across uh, the principles can be applied for musculoskeletal health uh, in general. So. so the three key reasons why patients come to see us is because they want to understand the meaning of their pain. They want to develop strategies to manage this pain and they want to have a plan to get back to living. So this basically sets the scene on how we want to communicate with patients. So if I want to provide the patient with an explanation about their problem, I need to put myself in their shoes and understand how they understand the problem themselves uh, and have a good understanding of the strategies they have. Uh, so I can then, so we can then devise a plan to get them back to doing the things that they like. Now, for us to get them back to living, we need to understand what it, what it is living for them. Uh, and Often in physio, you know, in the past, we used to be really uh, uh, focused on understanding the patient's impairments uh, and then fixing those impairments to get them better at doing some of the things that we gave them. Uh, and nowadays, we really want to understand the patient's goals and that drives or guides uh, the, the approach that we take to get them back doing the things that they love doing. So if we use an example uh, of a patient, um, we can, using again the common sense model that Sam explained before, the, the, the patient's mindset in response to pain is influenced by the knowledge that they have, the contextual uh, situation. And in the case of this particular patient, there was a lot of stress at the time of pain onset. And, and also he had lost his brother uh, around the time that his pain became uh, severe. So the cognitive representation of pain that this patient developed was that his problem, his pain was related to disc degeneration. And this was informed mainly by the by a surgeon that he saw uh, in one of the first consults. And the cause was related to bending and lifting. Uh, he was a beekeeper uh, and he also used to um, participate in race car driving. And so he spent a lot of time uh, as kind of working as a mechanic in the, uh, under the hood of his car. So that is the rationale as to why he degenerated his back. 
The consequences is that this doesn't get better. It just gets more degenerated. So worsening over time. And the, he's got no control over that degeneration. And the only way that he can control his pain is by avoiding activities. So what did he do based on that representation? He started protecting his back, bracing. He stopped flexing his back, as you can see in the picture. So he's flexing the trunk, but not flexing his back. And he avoided value activities. Now, was that effective? It wasn't effective. In fact, he had a, an increase in pain and disability as a consequence of it. And the emotional response that he had as a consequence of, uh, of this failed attempt to, uh, to improve was fear, frustration, and uh, it also affected his mood. So that is a, it's a, an unfortunate common story with uh, patients with muscle little pain. But it kind of sets the scene for us to understand that the way that he thought about his, the health of his back affected his behavior and his emotional response. So to change that, his understanding and to change that mindset, what the research tells us that is education is often not sufficient and providing patients with a, with a new experience that makes sense to them may be necessary. And I'll be bold enough to say that it is necessary. Um, so that patients can then challenge their original mindset and be offered a new way of thinking about their problem. One of the things that we also know is that what people say may be different to what people think. So we've done some, some work in this area and the way that we, so if you think of implicit beliefs as being our implicit bias. Uh, so it's the way that we think automatically uh, and the way that our brain makes association between different constructs. Uh, so we may say, for instance, that it's safe to bend, but when you look at this, this girl bending to pick up her shoe, she's not flexing her back. And perhaps her implicit bias is that bending is bad for the back and maybe she's got a negative um, perception about the, the structures of her back, an unhealthy perspective. And some research will tell us that implicit beliefs may in fact predict behavior and the choices that we make. Uh, so understanding what people think deeply uh, is really important. And oftentimes one of the only ways that we can come to that is when we expose the person to the threat. So for instance, if we think that we are really strong uh, in you know, when we think of our back as being really strong and it's okay to be rounded, I may choose to lift a box with a rounded back. Whereas if I think of my back as being vulnerable, if I round and I'm thinking that I've got a disc bulge, that may um, affect how I choose to lift the box in a different way by keeping my back straight. So we had some interest in this, uh, this difference between explicit and implicit beliefs. And that's something that we looked in a, a little bit more depth in my, um, in my PhD. And we used a, a, a very well-established uh, psychological measure or an outcome measure that is well-established and used in the, in, in the psychological, in the psychology literature, which is the implicit association task. Um, and that, that, that task is basically a, a sorting out task. So participants will sit in front of a computer and they will be presented with two different constructs. In the case of my study, round back and straight back. Uh, and they will be presented with words that meant uh, safety or danger. And all they had to do was to associate the image of the, or the word that present, was presented in the middle of the screen with the construct that was on the top. So it's like a sorting out task, but you have to do it really quickly because the stimulus of the image of the word only appears for a second. So it gives us an insight in what are the quickest associations that people can make in, the, in their minds. So we looked at people with, uh, that were pain-free <clears throat> and we looked at patients with back pain. And we also looked at physiotherapists that manage patients with back pain. And what the graph shows us is that in the three groups on average, patients were, or participants were, had an implicit bias that rounding their back when they're lifting and bending is dangerous. So that gives us a, a, an insight that in society, um, it's very common to believe that rounding your back is dangerous. 
And that may be a bias that drive how people behave. Uh, and we've done, just recently replicated this study um, with a cohort in Brazil. It hasn't been published yet, but the, the results are very similar. And the interesting thing is that when you asked people to, to self-report if they felt the round back was dangerous for the back, on average, they said it wasn't. So again, we can see this mismatch between what we say and what we deeply believe. So in the clinic, you know, how do you, how do you get to that? Uh, and I guess the point that I'm trying to get across is that if you simply ask patients what they really believe in, you know, um, you know, I had a patient today that I asked him if he thought that the pain and the sensation that he was feeling in his arm was related to damage in his, uh, in his neck or his nerve. And he said, no, I don't think like that. And I've been seeing another physio who educated me that pain doesn't always equal damage. And, but his behavior when I started examining him wasn't matching what he was saying. And it wasn't until I got him to, uh, to rotate his neck and look behind, which was similar to a task that he's done right early on at the pain on set, uh, that he felt quite frightened of doing that. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, so why don't you want to rotate your neck? Well, because when I saw the surgeon, he said that although degeneration is very common uh, in my age, he said that I need myself, I have to be careful because that degeneration can increase. So I shouldn't be using my neck as much unless I have to. And perhaps the surgeon was trying to convey the message that doing contact sports or lifting weights or, or, or something a little bit more intense. And, but the, the patient, the message that he took away from it is that I shouldn't use my neck. So this guy walking around really guarded with, with his neck. So at a conscious level, for him, pain doesn't equal damage because he's being offered that information. But when he embodies that, or maybe he doesn't embody that, that message, and he actually protects his body as he's trying to do tasks that, that are provocative. So that's just an example to highlight this discrepancy. And behavior experiments, they, they create that very context for us to communicate uh, while patients are performing a task. And we can explore their pain, their behaviors, and their emotional responses. So this particular patient today, when he was turning, and he was really guarded, uh, and I asked him about it, and that's when the interaction with the surgeon uh, came up. And I asked him, so how did you feel when he told you that? And he said, well, to me, it was like a life sentence. So that's the belief that is driving a lot of his behavior. And he wasn't aware of that until he was exposed to that and until that emotion, of, that emotion um, came to, to, um, to the surface. And he became quite emotional during that, that part of the, the session. Um, so it, it allows us to kind of try to, to see this, the, the, if the explicit and the implicit beliefs, if they're matching in a session or during the performance of a task. Uh, and it also may elicit body responses that the person may not be aware of. So another task that this particular patient today was quite frightened of doing was lifting his arm above his shoulder level. And when I asked him to do it with both arms, he said it felt different, uh, but he thought he was doing the same movement. And when, I, when he looked in the mirror, there was a big difference. On one side, he was really free and relaxed, and on the other side, he was really guarded and holding his breath and kind of looking away from the arm. And I asked him, what do you see? And he said, well, that's, that is not what I feel. And it, it looks bizarre, that looks really abnormal. So that was a kind of a, bringing him back to the body and making him connect with that behavior. So if we have a look at how we can um, go through this, this process of behavior experimentation. So let's say we have a patient that has a problem bending forward, uh, like the patient that I started off with a, with a case study. And we invite the patient and say, you know, can you pick this weight for me? Um, and the patient might will do the, the usual way. And you say, so what did you notice when you did that? And the patient might say, oh, look, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, patients are not aware of how they do things. And then you ask them to repeat and to do it again and, and notice. And perhaps you may suggest to them, you know, what did you notice with your breath? Or did you hold your breath? 
and the patient will reflect on that and say, oh, yes, I did. So you're not relaxing, are you, when you're doing this? And kind of here I'm shortcutting the, 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 the process. And so what do you think would happen if I asked you to relax over and pick the weight? As opposed to in this particular case, you know, he was, he's holding his breath, he's propping his hand on his, on his thigh, he's bracing his belly, uh, and he's lifting his head. So he's um, adopting behaviors to protect his back. So I'm not telling him to relax and bend over. I'm asking him, what do you think would happen if you relaxed and you bent over? I don't think I'll get back up. I'll, I'll get stuck down there. So why do you think that? Well, because that's how I had one of the major flare-ups that I had since I had this back pain. So that the, the idea of bending over in a relaxed manner, the, the, the memory is linked to an event of having a flare-up that led him to go to hospital, to have injections and to be offered a spinal fusion. So you can see that the association between relaxing and bending and rounding the back is linked to this really strong memory, a vivid memory of, not only of, a, of a lived experience of a very negative situation. That kind of uh, um, set the trajectory for, for this young man to go forward. So simply asking the person to, uh, to do a task in a different way without exploring those beliefs and those, uh, and those thoughts, uh, you kind of may miss the point. Um, so the, the question that would follow is, you know, how sure are you this would happen? You know, is this, is this a fact or is this a belief? And then the patient performs the task in a different way. And then you can ask him to appraise the task. So did you get stuck? What was your experience? So that is an example where you're kind of taking a simple task, which is bending over, picking up a weight. Uh, and if I think of my traditional training as a physio, I would ask the patient to do it. And then I'll say, okay, this is what you did. You held your breath, you kept your back straight. That's not how you do it. This is how you do it. And then I'll show him and I ask him to repeat. So what I'm presenting to you there as the traditional training is you identify the way that the patient does something and you show them what is wrong and you tell them what is right. That is not an experience, that is a lecture. Versus what we are talking about here where you are conversing with the patient and genuinely interested in as to why they are doing this. Is this a behavior that you learned or is this a behavior that you've been told to do it? And, and in that way, in that conversation, patients are reflecting and they are laying new memories about that situation. I hope that is kind of making some sense. So if we put this in a, in a more, um, uh, like if we distill that process uh, and we're trying to create this context to enable exploration of their beliefs and their emotions. And the, the tasks that we're gonna look at are the, the tasks that are the most provocative or feared or avoided for the patients. So we pick those tasks and we ask them to perform the task and we ask them to predict what is the outcome, just like we did before. What would happen if you bend over and picked up the weight? And once they do the task, you ask them to notice the behavior in their body. And then you may promote, uh, you may expose them in a new way. And when you do that, you ask them, what is your anticipated outcome if you perform in a different way? And here you can ask patients about how much pain they expect. And after they performed the task, you can appraise and say, so how much pain did you experience? And that, if, you, if there is a discrepancy between what they expected, so let's say seven out of 10 pain versus what they experienced, four out of 10 pain, that discrepancy, that mismatch, creates an opportunity for learning. So the, the, the discrepancy between expectancy and experience, that, that error in prediction creates learning. And that gives an opportunity for us to then capitalize on that and creating more teachable moments for patients and creating this new experience. And basically what we do, we reflect the experience, we repeat the exposure and we progress the exposure. 
and the progression of the exposure will really be guided by the sensitivity profile of the patient. So if the patient is highly distressed or highly sensitized, the progression might be slower. Uh, but if they're not as uh, distressed or sensitized, or if the new way really reduces the sensitivity, um, then you can progress a little bit more, a, a little bit quicker. So a very important thing to remind you guys here is that behavior experiments, it's only a, a, a component of a full approach. So the, this is part of a, a person-centered approach where we screen for red flags, as per usual for serious pathology and psychosocial risk factors. Uh, we use person-centered communication. Uh, we use behavior experiments. So again, this is a, a component of it. And we provide a targeted examination and management that is guided by the patient's goals. And the management plan, it's a, it's a shared decision. So at the end of the session, we invite the patient uh, and with, with this guy today, yeah, I asked him, so what did you learn today from the session? What are the key points? So based on that, what are the things that you need to do to address those things? And how can we bridge the gap between where you are and the goals that you want to achieve? And that again is a conversation uh, to, to get towards the patient, um, the patient plan. So if we go back to that initial patient, he was a little bit slow in the, in the, in the progression, but when he was bending forward, he was thinking about the generation of his back, his back was crumbling. So the first thing for him was to actually learn how to relax and, and get some flexion into his back and change his thinking process, thinking of his back and imagining his back as being a healthy structure. And then he was taken through a process using um, relaxed breathing to enable him to relax in flexion. And the session only took him to, to bending from, uh, from sitting. And a few weeks later, he was able to bend forward and relax back. And then he started to learn that actually flexing his back was uh, providing him with reduction of discomfort. And the more he did it, the less stiff he felt. So you can see there is a, a 180 on the mindset on the old way, which is keep it straight because if I round and bend, it crumbles uh, and will further degenerate to round and use and bend and repeat it uh, because that will make my back healthier. And that is a process that for some people is really slow and for other people is faster. And the process that he was taken through was cognitive functional therapy, uh, which involves a, a process of uh, exposing, using behavior experiments to expose patients to very specific tasks, using that to help patients make sense of uh, like reconceptualizing their, their presentation and providing lifestyle changes that can create a better context. So for this particular person was managing his stress response, was adopting better sleeping habits and getting active regularly. So if we look at the, the changing mindset, so his new cognitive representation was that his spine was sensitized, that you know he, he, the changes in his scan was they were not dismissed, but they were contextualized and saying, look, those structures are sensitive, but you using your back is not gonna make those structures become uh, more degenerated. In fact, it, you actually reduce the sensitivity of your back. He realized that pain is multifactorial and his behaviors that, that he was adopting were unhelpful and that he could actually achieve some control over his pain. The behavioral response was to, to don't protect, to get strong and to stay engaged. So doing things such as working under the hood of his car again, what part of his rehab? Was that effective? Yes, it was effective. He was more active, he was walking again, he was doing his bush walks, uh, and he was back working his car. And the emotional response is that he had a more positive outlook about his back. He was active, com confidence, confident, and socializing. So this, uh, this particular patient, we published this as a case report in the Journal of Orthopedic um, and Sports Physical Therapy. Um, in 2017, 17, and it has a, a, a mix of qualitative and quantitative data to uh, discuss the process of, of change for this particular patient. So we're not saying that the, it's all about this approach and we're not saying we're not looking at the effects of that approach, but we are, we are trying to understand the process by which this patient went through. 
which was quite um, uh, quite a good learning opportunity for us. So once you have this experience in the clinic, do patients go away and do, for this particular guy, do, does he go home and just do bending exercises? And no, that's not true. The bending exercises work as a mechanism to create a new memory and to train his body and to help him to embody this new mindset. But he's, he's asked to integrate these new strategies into his daily life and to engage with family and friends to support the process. So go home and explain this to your wife. And if you feel like you're stuck or things don't make sense, or she asks you questions that you can't answer, email me or bring it to the next question, the next session, and we can discuss it. We encourage this health, healthy lifestyle changes. And our job is to coach patients to progress gradually uh, in the direction of their goals. And we also ask patients to respond differently to pain in a more positive way and constructive way. Now, this graph here, or these graphs, they're really busy, and I, I don't expect you to, to look at the specifics of the graph. But this was a case series that we ran um, a couple of years ago during my PhD, and it's just to demonstrate that the journey is quite different for people. You know, the patient one had a really significant change very quickly. Patient two had a more gradual change. Patient three had a gr gradual change with a significant flare-up. Uh, so the bottom line here is that the journey is unique and individual. For some, it's quick. For others, it takes a bit longer. And provision of support during that journey is really important. So nowadays, you know, keeping in touch by email with patients. So the patient that I saw today, his job is to go home, uh, explain to his partner, write down, because you wanted a, a, an explanation for his pain, and I gave him one, and I said, look, I want you to go home and write in your own words how you would explain the reason why your, your neck and arm are sore. And for patients that are, uh, that are away, you can do, use telehealth uh, uh, as booster sessions and bringing them back into when they have flare-ups. The other important part of this journey is to reassure that flare-ups are normal. And when they occur, that we take an approach that is active. Because what we often see is that that negative mindset tends to resurge when patients have flare-ups. So in, in knee osteoarthritis, for instance, we know it's a, it's a, it's a chronic condition that the trajectory can fluctuate. So when patients have a flare-up, they usually tend to, to adopt this more biomedical view that, oh yeah, my cartilage is definitely degrading and there's nothing I can do, and the surgery is ine inevitable. Uh, whereas it could be related to the fact that they've done something that was a bit much, or they're more stressed, underslept, uh, and feeling run down. And when they come to the clinic, reassurance doesn't come from just educating the patient, but actually taking them through an approach where we try to live this experience again. So again, using behavior experiments and providing a new experience. And the more they do that, the, what we see is that the better it is for them to deal with those flare-ups because it kind of gets them back into building their confidence level. So in summary, we have to listen actively. We have to screen for red flags, pathology, and psychosocial risk factors uh, and refer onwards as necessary. We need to explore patients' behaviors, emotions, and beliefs. Uh, we need to observe how they do it. We need to expose them to the very fast tasks that they're frightened of. We need to make, to make them reflect on, on how they do it and repeat those tasks. And we also need to integrate that to daily life and coach and support them towards their goals. So I'd like to thank uh, my uh, collaborators, uh, interstate, uh, overseas, and uh, the all the the um, researchers and clinicians involved in the Opus CRE. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, JP. That was wonderful. Now we've got five minutes for some questions. Um, JP, we've got one up on the screen here, which I'll read out loud um, and I might get you to, to answer in the first instance and maybe I'll jump in after you. Uh, the question is from Manu Tamang in Bhutan, an international attendee. Um, Manu is asking, is it necessary to give a lecture on pain neuroscience if the patient doesn't have implicit or explicit, explicit beliefs about the pain? 
In fact, I see many patients who are clueless about what's going on with them. How do we help such patients make sense of their pain? Uh, great question. Thanks for participating and thanks for the lovely question. Um, I have to be honest, I don't educate any patients in pain neuroscience. Um, and I try, what I try to do is try to meet the patient at their knowledge. Uh, so I try to gather what is their understanding. So I generally try to put myself in the patient's shoes and see how they see their condition, what are the actions they've taken, uh, how that has impacted on them. And I think Sam provided some really uh, lovely questions to, to get a sense of that. Based on that, the taking them through this experience that I just talked about often makes, the, that's the learning that occurs. Uh, so it's not the lecture, it's the, it's the process. And what the literature tells us is that if you educate a patient before you expose them, you actually minimize the chance of learning because that discrepancy, that mismatch between expectancy and experience gets reduced. And so we don't tend to educate patients right until the end. And I see that education is an active learning process throughout. So during the interview, you're making them reflect with your questions. Then during the examination, you're, uh, you're asking questions and making them reflect and you build this experience. And at the end, you provide them some knowledge to support uh, the messages that you try to give with that experience for the patient. So the education is pretty much based on, the, on what the evidence tells about that person's condition. So what do we know about knee osteoarthritis? Now my job is to educate the patient on how does he take that into his particular situation. And I, don't, I wouldn't sit the patient down and explain about neurophysiology uh, unless the patient asks me about, which often doesn't really happen. So I, I hope this answers your question. And helping patients make sense of pain is probably one of the most rewarding things that we can do, but it's really challenging. And for some patients, day one, they really get it. It's like a, like a switch that changes. And other patients, it's more of a process. Yeah, that's a great answer, JP. And again, I would just jump in there and say that, you know, from a, a theoretical point of view, I guess what, what, what we know from health behavior theory is that um, everyone holds um, some beliefs about their pain. So um, I'm just picking up on that point, Manu, where you, you raised around the, the lack of sometimes implicit or explicit beliefs that, that people appear to be presenting with and say that usually people are presenting because they are trying to make sense of their situation and needing some help and support with that. So, so they will have a way of making sense of their pain, whether that is you know, what they think caused it um, and, and what they're worried about, why they've come to see you today. So it's just a matter of how we tap into those, I guess, to, to really try to elicit that understanding. And that's where I think that, that um, you know, yes, direct questioning, but sometimes people can't articulate that very explicitly. So that's where behavioral experimentation is a really powerful um, um, tool to have there. Um, and, and I don't know, JP, about your experience with, um, you know, people from, from culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds or people that maybe don't have um, or differing levels of health literacy, for example. I think in, in those sort of situations too, where somebody's really lacking a lot of understanding about their pain, I can imagine that behavioral experimentation um, is useful there too. I don't know if there's been any research in that space. Yeah, look, I think that's a great point. And, uh, but I, I find that if, you, if you're taking a person through a, their own experience, it's really hard to challenge your own experience, right? It's really hard to challenge your own data, right? Uh, so if, we, if the patient has different concepts about how they should be doing things, that often comes up um, in, the, in the experimentation. And the behavior experiments, they're, they're, they are a way of, it's like you, during the interview, you, you understand the patient's hypothesis about their problem. And then you get them to do a task and you check the validity of their hypothesis and you check if it's working. And if it's not working, can we create a new strategy to, to make it work? And does that new strategy is in fact helpful? And the patient is at the center of that and they participate with you. So it's not a, a you know, I can have a hunch of what I think it's going to happen in the behavior experiment, but I'm not trying to box the patient into a, a particular category. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic process 
And that dynamic process, the patient feels that. And I think that makes them feel heard and understood. And they feel like you're participating in that journey. And they feel good because they're coming up with the answers. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we talk about self-management. And I think that's where self-management starts. It starts at developing this, uh, this new identity about the problem and this new ability of managing the problem in a way that you, you are taking control, but you have support and you know the person, like the, the clinician has your back. And if something happens, you can go back and, and check. Um, and, and I think if, uh, if the patient comes from a very different culture to mine, uh, I'll ask them to explain. You know, if you were back in your community, how would you deal with this problem? You know, how would you be treated if you were back in, uh, in Brazil, if you were back in, um, in Nepal? What would be different? And some patients go, oh, it would be totally different because that's how we see pain. Uh, you know, there was a lovely work from Tori Madden uh, a few years ago where she, um, she was talking about working with people in, in, like in deep Africa and with the Zulu uh, community and their perception of pain. They couldn't think of pain in their back or their knee or their neck. Pain was a, was a whole body experience linked to an, a spiritual experience. So here comes white men trying to you know, show them impairments about their body, it's not really gonna cut it. <laughs> so, but I, you gotta be educated and the patient is the best resource for that. Yeah, so empowering the patient. That's really beautifully explained, JP. Yeah. I've got one last question here. If we've got time, we're going two minutes over, but it's from Tina. Um, are there any particular questionnaires that can be used as outcome measures to understand patient belief systems? Hmm. JP, do you use any in the clinic? Uh, we, we do, we use questionnaires. We don't often use questionnaires to understand. It's not just a beliefs questionnaire. So every patient that comes into our door, they will be screened with the Oribro, the short form Oribro musculoskeletal questionnaire, which is a, it's 10 questions. Uh, and it's a multidimensional screening tool. So it's a great way of you understanding the severity of the problem, um, uh, you know, it asks about sleep, tension, depression, stress, uh, anxiety, uh, pain beliefs, uh, fear of movement, um, ability to go back to work. Uh, so we get this really quick profile. Patients take, you know, two minutes to answer it, but it's really rich for us. And at times we see patients that look really good on paper. And when you start talking to them, it doesn't match. So the explicit is not matching their story. And other times that can become a really good conversation starter because you go, you scored really high here on, on how this is affecting your mood. Is this related to your pain or is that something else happening? So uh, we feel like the, those, the multidimensional questionnaire is a, is a good way of facilitating patients to understand that pain is multifactorial and to target very specific domains. Uh, so long answer to your question. We don't use specifically beliefs ones, but there are lots of beliefs questionnaires out there. Okay. okay, we might need to wrap up there, but thank you everybody for coming along today. A huge thank you to you, JP, for your time and sharing your insights with us. And we look forward to catching everybody at the next Opus webinar. Thanks very much. Thanks, Anne. Thanks everybody. Bye -bye.